Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This episode is going to be a fun one with my friend Brian Rimza. We're going to be talking about roosting turkeys and setting up on turkeys that are either in the roost or in run and gun situations. And the youth turkey hunts here in Arizona and the general season uh, turkey hunts are about to start. And I know they're already open in New Mexico and Utah and Colorado. They're already going. So hopefully you can get some value from this. Uh, Brian is a very experienced bow hunter. And uh, he, he also loves to shotgun hunt turkeys and we get to hunt together and I think you're going to find some value in this. I want to thank you guys for listening and supporting this podcast as much as you do. Uh, I also want to thank the sponsors, uh, GoHunt.com Insider, Kuyu.com, Phonescope.com, and Outdoorsmans.com. And you can actually go in the show notes and uh, find the different discount codes and promo codes uh, with these great companies. I want to thank them for their support. Guys, you can send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. If you've got any questions or comments, you can follow along our adventures on Instagram at jscottoutdoors. My associate, Dar Colburn, at Dar Colburn, and then on, on the Facebook page, uh, J. Scott Outdoors. That's my uh, business Facebook page. You can also go to my website, jscottoutdoors.com. I just really appreciate all the support that you guys give me both on this podcast and on my social media channels. And uh, wish you the best of success uh, on your hunts. Uh, coming up and uh, please let me know how you do and hopefully some of these tips that Brian and I go over are going to help you. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I'm sitting here in my office. I've got my friend Brian Rimza whom we've just been on a hunt together for turkeys and um, then he just made a whirlwind tour up. Uh, He had another turkey tag and went up in one day. Basically you got up there yesterday afternoon and shot a bird and we're headed home Um, today I want to talk about because, uh, for Arizona turkey hunters, uh, the youth season starts this weekend and then the general season starts, I believe the following weekend after that. And so we're kind of getting in a situation where a bunch of people are starting to think about turkeys, uh, specifically in our state. And, uh, most of what we're going to be talking about today is Merriam's turkeys, but you know, Brian, you've shot the Goulds and the Rio and the Merriam's here in the state of Arizona. So I think we, you know, it's, it's all relevant. Um, first of all, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's always great to have you on. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking about roosting turkeys and talking about setups because I think those two things, if people can improve on getting turkeys roosted and then improve on their setups, they're going to kill more turkeys. And I think even you and I, we've done it so much and we've done it a lot together. I mean, still, I mean, we had uh, on our hunt last week, we had setups that after the setup, you know, we're looking at each other going, why did we set up here? Like, what were we thinking? And it's funny how when those times come and you automatically just start throwing stuff down and setting up when really, you're worried about the bird seeing you. You're worried about the birds coming in too fast. You know, you, if you take a little bit of time, a lot of times it means a bird getting killed and, and not getting killed. So that's going to be fun to talk about. Yeah, it's definitely, setups are definitely critical, especially when you throw in the mix of trying to shoot birds with a bow and you throw in the mix of using a blind. I mean, if you get a bird to commit with a shotgun, your effective range is a lot greater and, you know, you can make a few more mistakes when you got a a gun in your hand as opposed to a bow. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, the thing too, is like, um, with the blinds, you bring up a good point of, you know, uh, depending on your windows and such, I mean, you could have a bird come in behind you and you've got no shot. Whereas with the shotgun, you know, you, you can swivel around a little bit. So it's going to be fun to kind of talk about that. Um, and are you done turkey hunting for the year? I'm not sure. Uh, Nicole and I just talked, and we may go buy a couple of tags up on the San Carlos for the third season. They do have some tags left, and we may go buy some tags and, and head up there for a kind of a, a whirlwind weekend and see if we can maybe harvest a couple more birds. But if not, then I'll be done for the year so far. I mean, I've been on two different turkey hunts and 
been a part of four or five different turkey harvests along with three or four botched opportunities. Yeah, for sure. Before we get into um, today's topics, um, I was with you when you shot your Goulds uh, in Arizona, shot it with your bow. Um, That was several years ago. That was a fun deal. You finally drew that tag. Uh, And then you actually put in and drew the Rio tag up in, I believe, 13B. Yes. Um, Curious to get your thoughts on the Rios in 13B and how that hunt went and your, your thoughts on their progression there as, as you know, how, how those birds are doing. You know, I don't know a whole lot about how they're doing when I was up there uh, two years ago, it was, there was plenty of birds and they were super vocal and very responsive. But again, you're only talking about two permits. And I think when I had the tag, there was one permit per hunt. And now I believe there's two permits per hunt. So anytime you have very limited numbers of hunters in the field, obviously your experience is going to be much greater and the birds in general are going to be much more responsive because nobody goes to the strip just to drive around. Yeah. People go there for a purpose, whether it be deer hunting or, you know, hunting turkeys or hunting lions. So you're very rarely do you run into someone just running roads and driving around, which educates and impacts vocalization as vocalizations of birds out in the field. Uh, so it's kind of a unique state land hunt because you're only dealing with one other hunter up there. And typically there's enough birds to go around. You guys can, you know, get away from each other. I think that's one of the things like with the Goulds hunts, you know, uh, it's been such a success story in Arizona, the NWTF and the game and fish department has done a phenomenal job, um, bringing the Goulds back in Arizona. But one of the things I'm starting to see now is that the birds have expanded so much and they're basically in every sky Island mountain chain. But where we're at now is where, where hunts say five, six, seven, eight years ago, maybe there was one or two permits. Then they split the hunts into two hunts. Well, now some of these units are getting, you know, 12, 10, 12, 15 permits per hunt. And it's kind of difficult because For the Goulds, um, it seems as though a lot of the units, there's really not tons of areas to hunt. And so while there's very few tags compared to Merriam's hunts, sometimes those Goulds hunts can be kind of crowded. I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, I think they're definitely a popular hunt and people are very excited to draw a tag as they should be because you can't hunt them anywhere else unless you're going to go down to Mexico. And I think maybe New Mexico has a resident tag or something, but I'm not sure. But the deal is, is that people tend to hunt the same places because the birds were traditionally introduced in one canyon or another, and they have expanded tremendously. And so you can get away from other people and get into a lot of birds. Uh, The hunt up on Mount Lemmon is very unique because you're dealing with campers and oftentimes Easter may coincide with the hunt, which increases the number of people up there. So it's kind of a non-traditional turkey hunt because you're seeing lots of people every day and there's turkeys mixed in all over the place i know you've experienced it with casey brooks up there and a couple other people and yeah and i mean on mount lemon there's really not a lot of flat spots so in essence wherever you have a flat spot you have a campsite so wherever you have a campsite that's where the birds are because they it's i mean everywhere else is just straight up and down i mean there are places in in 33 that you can you know get down in some more transitional areas and find some birds um and i'm not complaining at all because it is a success story and i don't know what the exact answer is i don't know if you split it up into multiple multiple hunts or if you just maybe do one season and do it 30 days long and then people can choose to go when they want i don't know what the exact answer is but uh the nwtf and the game and fish have done a phenomenal job in reintroducing those goulds um, and they are a fantastic bird. You've been down to Mexico also with me on my Gould's turkey hunts down there. And, right. Um, they are just an unbelievable bird. And I'm so glad that we have them back here in our state of Arizona to hunt, even though the tags, I mean, sometimes drawing a Gould's tag is like harder than drawing a sheep tag. There are people that have been trying for years. I think the max points for Gould's is, is either at or above 20 points now at this point in time. And I know people are really looking for that experience. And, you know, the Goulds hunt's a great experience in Arizona. It's, to me, they're just a tremendously fun bird to hunt. They're generally 20 to 25% bigger than the Merriam's birds that we have. They're pretty vocal and they're really beautiful with the real white tipped tail fan and, and such. And they live in a very unique 
part of the state, very unique country. You know, you can kill a ghouls in a prickly pear in a prickly pear flat in Arizona, which is just kind of an unusual circumstance. Pretty neat, you know. Um, I I think uh, you know Goulds. If I was going to give advice to Goulds hunters, I would say maybe hunt during the week if you have the opportunity. Maybe not even go opening weekend and and maybe hunt like a Tuesday through a Friday morning and go and you would probably literally see no one. Um, and, but you know, everybody's got schedules and what have you, but you know, if I could offer some advice, it'd be, you know, do your scouting, but maybe just let the initial flurry of, of, you know, the opening weekend, so, so to speak, traffic come in, do their hunt, uh, and then go hunt during the week. The other thing I like about Goulds is seems like during the day, they're a lot more vocal for a longer period of time compared to the Merriams and even the Rios. And I, I don't know if that's just from a pressure standpoint, but they really act like a turkey should. They gobble, they strut, you know, they're, they're, they're real interactive birds. Well, it's funny that you say hunt during the week. You know, obviously not everybody can do that. You know, it just depends on your schedule and your family. But what you can do is spend time in the field the weekends prior because no one will be in the field. Yeah. Very few people will go down and scout for turkeys. And if you can pinpoint where those birds are at, pinpoint those roost trees, pinpoint those setups – you can make yourself much more effective during that opening week. And even though everybody else is out in the field, you're already set up, you're already dialed in and you can get down there and make it happen pretty quick. Uh, what it's kind of interesting. You mentioned that because someone texted me yesterday after I posted that bird on Facebook, that it seems like a lot of my hunts are quick and, you know, I get it done pretty quick. And a lot of that comes down to one, having previous knowledge, uh, the spot that I killed that bird at yesterday. Um, we've been there. You know, it's a spot you turned me on two years ago and it's good. Yeah. It's always reliable. It's a producer. Yeah. And so, you know, that makes it helpful. But at the same time on other hunts, you know, I just spend the time prior to the hunt to put in all the legwork. And so oftentimes I'm ready to rock and roll. Whereas a lot of people are figuring it out on those first three or four days. For sure. And I think that leads us right into our first um, topic, talking about roosting turkeys and You know, Dar and I for many years have been guys that have hunted with us. You know, they just, they kind of shake their heads because Dar and I typically, you know, if we're, it, you know, we're usually never back to camp, you know, an hour after dark at least or, or later. And, um, you know, they're just like, why are you guys out so late? And it's, it's one of those things I know we started hunting together and, and roosting turkeys is kind of an art in a way, um, But you have to be kind of disciplined and you have to be willing to go through the details and go through the process of getting a bird roosted. There's much more to roosting a turkey than just driving down the road, getting out, hearing a bird in a general direction and going, yeah, we got a turkey roosted. My question to you would be the importance of roosting turkeys and what I would call exact roosting. What have you learned and and you know, what is your general thought of getting birds roosted? And I mean, exactly where they're roosted. I mean, the, to me, the most important time of any turkey hunt is that evening, because if you can roost a bird, then you already know where you're starting in the morning, you know, where you're going to go set up. And I think you'll agree with me that the most productive time to kill a bird is that first 30, 40 minutes hour after he comes off the roost. Cause they're usually still pretty vocal. They're still kind of getting things figured out and you can still, you know, persuade them to come your direction. Um, I think what I learned from you, you know, growing up turkey out with my dad, we always roosted birds and we did a pretty good job. Uh, I would say better than most, you know, we would get within a couple hundred yards of the bird and have a pretty good idea where he was at. Uh, what I learned from you is that it's really important to pinpoint within, I would say 75 to a hundred yards of where that bird's at. And if you can do that, you can make yourself more effective because you can get in there right in on them. And if they just pitch out a short distance, they're almost in your setup, you're ready to go. And it just makes you way more effective. And in order to do that, you know, you got to be willing to walk in on those birds in the dark, keep those birds gobbling once they're in the tree and they'll gobble for an hour, maybe sometimes even longer uh, after they've flown up in that tree take advantage of that. I mean, if you walk into a bird in the dark and you're not using a light or anything like that, and you're not 
overly disturbing them. They're used to having elk and all sorts of other animals walk under them. So they're not going to freak out if you walk under them, as long as you're not talking or, you know, shining lights at them and things like that. You can really pinpoint where they're at and then figure out exactly where you need to be in the morning. And therefore they sleep the whole night and you're already there in the morning. So, I mean, you're ready to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, this last weekend, uh, we were hunting together and, you know, we had really good interactions pretty much every, uh, time we went out with birds. And that one afternoon was just one of those days we, we, had some birds out in an open meadow that we thought were going to roost. I'd heard them the night before up kind of on this, up on the straw. And we sat there for a couple hours in the afternoon because I thought they'd work their way up there and go roost. And they didn't. I don't know if they chose a different roost that night or, you know, if someone bumped them or what have you. And you and I looked at each other. It's like, we got to go because there's like 30, 40 minutes left of light. And yes, the, these birds may come in, but it's really not looking like it. So let's use this time to go out and roost other birds so that we had a game plan in the morning. And I think it's, like you said, it's so important to get a bird roosted and know his exact location. So in the morning, you you have a really good chance. If you, if you know exactly where the bird is, I mean, I would almost say that you have a 75% chance of getting a shot with a shotgun if you have a bird roosted and you know his proximity within you know, say 50 to 75 yards, maybe a hundred yards, you pretty much have a, you know, I would say 50 to 75% chance of getting a shot as soon as he flies down. Now with that, we've been together roosting birds and you've had situations where you can't get that exact location. But I, I wanted to ask you um, to talk, tell the listeners kind of how we kind of tag team getting a bird roosted and how we did it specifically on those birds, which you end up shooting one the next morning, um, how that worked and how that process of, of, you know, using two people to roost a bird works. Well, I mean, the first thing you got to have a bird goblin somewhere. And if you don't, you got to keep running in the road. I mean, we typically will run a road and then get out and coyote howl or, or use a crow call predominantly i think you and i have both found that a coyote how works the best and you know that hour so basically from seven to eight o'clock you just keep going until you get a bird a bird to gobble and then once you get that bird to gobble you got to pinpoint it and the scenario you're talking about we had a bird that gobbled and he was too far off for us to go cross country and try and pinpoint so we were able to utilize the topo programs that we both have on our phone and I was able to use the compass, uh, setting on the, on the program and, you know, put my phone in the direction of that bird and figure out kind of where he was at in the general area. Well, as it turned out, there was a road that I didn't know about. And so we drove up and got on that road and we were able to cut the distance and basically get right in that bird's lap. Mm -hmm. And once we had relocated him again, and now we were within 400 yards of him, you stayed back and just would coyote howl every two or three minutes. So I could sneak in there and pinpoint exactly where that bird was at. And we ended up getting it down to 50 yards, maybe yeah. 70 yards tops of where he was at. So much so that you you had all the geographic locations of the meadow, the group of trees. Like you knew, I said, do you know where we're going to set up? And you're like, yeah, I know right where we're going to set up. I know the group of trees they're in. And that's huge. But going back to what you said, I want to point out a couple of things when you're running and gunning on the roads, in my opinion. Um, so you're, you're driving and you're covering a distance, say you go about a mile, you stop. It's important to me. And I'm, I'm usually, you know, getting dirty looks from people. Cause I'm like going, okay, when we stop, like you get out quietly, you don't make a bunch of clanking noise. You try not to have your truck going ding, ding, ding. You know, you try not to have your lights on, you know, all those things I think are important. Immediately when you get there, you shut the truck off and you open the doors and you try not to go just, you know, clanking around and you're listening. Cause sometimes just from driving, the birds will already be in a tree and they'll be gobbling from the roar of your truck or the, you know, the sound of the tires on the gravel and they may be gobbling and you need to hear that when you first get out. So don't be talking. That's, that's one thing where I think I'm super detailed and, and, you know, almost anal on. Um, the other thing is I think it's important if, if you're fortunate to have someone with you, 
when you're doing the coyote howl, it's important, I think, to have someone stand 40 or 50 yards away from you or 20 or 30 yards at least because typically that obnoxious um, Primo's coyote howler that I use, which I think I have other calls that sound more realistic, but that one is just so loud and obnoxious. I think that's why those birds gobble to it. But it's important to have someone away from you so that because when you're calling, a lot of times I can't even hear the bird that sounds off because I'm right in the middle of that loud call. And, you know, I look at you and you're like, bird was right there. I'm like, I never heard a thing. Yeah, it's really important because that coyote how can be kind of long and drawn out. And if those birds are right on top of you, which has happened to us before, they'll gobble right in the beginning of it. And you won't even finish your call. And so I think that's critical to kind of spread out a little bit so you're not right next to the guy who's doing the coyote howl. And obviously, if you're a soul, you know, doing it solo, you got to make the best of it. And I've never had major problems doing it that way. But I mean, uh, you know, it, if you can use the tools to benefit you, it's important to do so. And, and I think that one thing I want to mention is that if you're driving around during the day hunting an area, if you're new to turkey hunting or you're new to the unit that you're hunting in, pay attention to those roads that are good loop roads that drive along the edge of a canyon or drive along the edge of a finger because birds don't roost typically in flat country there always is going to be some sort of contour and typically they like the ridges and so pay attention to that stuff when you're driving around and say you know this would be a good spot to come back in the evening time because you can hear a long ways and you know it's a good spot for a bird to roost so pay attention to that so when you're driving around because the nice thing about turkeys unlike some of the animals we hunt is you can go into a new spot and they're vocal and you cover country in that truck until you figure out where those birds are at. And once you figure out where those birds are at, then you start to pinpoint things. Yeah. I, I I think that's a, a a huge tip by, you know, covering country. Um, you mentioned something where we use the topo maps on our, on our phones, but you can also just observe what you're seeing. And you said, you know, canyons notice where roads are out in a flat and there may be a Canyon on either side that's a great candidate because now you've got on say the left side and the right side of the truck, you have parallel canyons or what have you, even if they're perpendicular where you've got contour breaks, which we know the birds typically walk across the flats on the tops of the ridges, fly straight out into the roost tree. Well, they, in, in order, the reason they don't roost on, you know, flat ground, so to speak, is they have to exert so much energy to get into the tree. Whereas those contour breaks, those ridge lines, those canyons and what have you, they literally can just pitch, be on flat ground, take a couple running steps and, you know, flap their wings a couple times and be up in a tree, even if they have to leapfrog, you know, and work their way up the tree. Um, contour breaks are huge. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, back to pinpointing the birds, you had mentioned where um, we used a road to circle around and you're like, that bird's like three quarters of a mile away, but there's a road that gets close. Well, when we got on the truck, we made a point not to drive right on top of the bird park back, you know, three or four or 500 yards or sometimes more, and then walk down the road. And it's dark, you know, you and I are walking in the dark. And then I said, okay, I'm going to back up. And I think it's specific and, and you can use radios too. I mean, if it's legal in your state, you can say, Hey, you know, call me if you need me to call on the radio or what we did is I said, I'll give you about four minutes or five, you know, we have a set time. I'll give you four minutes to get down there. I'm going to call one time. And then two minutes later, I'm going to call again so that it gives you a chance to leapfrog. If you needed to get a little closer to pin them down even more. Right. Um, and as far as marking, so I think one of the things that's important when you're the person that's actually getting close to the bird and trying to mark the bird is you don't want to have any lights on, no headlamps. You don't want to have the light on your phone. If you have to use your phone in your topo program to mark the bird or your GPS, highly recommend like turning your back to where the bird is, you know, putting your coat over, trying, you know, if, if. If you go walking down the road the night before and you've got a light on and you've got your phone and they, the bird sees the, the light, not always, but a lot of times the next morning, they're still going to remember that. I, I know people that say, oh, no, it's a turkey. They're dumb. They don't. Well, when they get hunted a lot on public ground, they do. 
So I try and minimize any human noise, any human lights, anything that's going to associate the noise they hear of me walking with a human. Thoughts? I agree with you. I mean, I think that we're, we're extreme on that part. I mean, we try to make, I want to put everything in my favor as possible. Right. And so we're super extreme on that. And some people will say, oh, it doesn't matter because it's just a dumb bird. But the, we're out there spe- exerting time and trying to hunt these guys, and we want to have a great experience. And so we try to put everything in our favor as possible. And we use our phones. You know, you dim them down, and then you put a jacket over it, and then you got to mark the spot, and you mark the spot, and you get out of there. I mean, you, you know, this last hunt that we were on together, the moon was full. So, I mean, it was like having a nightlight on. We yeah. could, I could see the entire meadows for my setups. I could see where I wanted to be, um, you know, and so it was – it was, it made things easier because having a full moon and we were fortunate because we were able to walk down the road and basically set up 50 yards off the road, which is nice because you can get in there quieter and you're not tripping over things and making a bunch of noise. Let's talk about if you don't mark it on a GPS, one of the things I like to do is mark it with a log, mark it with stacked rocks. I do not like to tie ribbons on trees. Um, you know, I just, guys, I would recommend not making a habit of tying a bunch of plastic ribbon on trees but mark it so that um you know a lot of times if if say there's a forest service road and then i'm down a skid trail road that's kind of just you know a blocked off road or something i'm gonna mark it with with some logs or some rocks so that when i'm walking in the morning i don't need a lamp i don't need a light and that i get to my mark where i'm gonna step over it basically in the skid trail where you know two logs put together in the middle of the skid trail And then I know from there, I've got to go 50 yards to the left or 75 yards to the right or keep going down the skid trail 100, you know, steps and I'm going to be right where I need to be. I think it's important. And I've even heard guys talk about, you know, back east where they're like raking the leaves. So in the morning, you know, they can come in a little bit quieter. Um, And let's talk about, okay, so that the, the other setup where you had birds where it was you, me and Nicole. Um, you had, uh, come out of a piece of country and we're coming back to camp. And that's another thing I want to talk about is when there's roosting time, even if you have a bird roosted, you and I are kind of similar in that we're kind of still roosting birds all the way back. Because if you're hunting with other people, they might not have birds roosted. So you're already going back towards camp. You might as well make a few stops and try and get a few other birds at least roosted in case your buddy doesn't have uh, anything to go after. Right. I, we, I was coming out because Jaron had shot two birds that, that night, and it was perfect roost time. And so I was trying to make sure that we had roosted, you know, maybe had some other birds to chase. And I had Jaron with me, so I wasn't going to go cross country and after a bird to try and pinpoint him down. And so... Again, I used the compass setting on my phone and was able to get a couple of tr- kind of triangulations of where the bird was at, had a pretty good idea where he was at. And we got in there in the morning, the next morning, and we set up and we were off. But we knew that we had to make an adjustment and we did. And it was really only about a 300 yard adjustment. Yeah. And well, you, you had two birds. You said, Jay, I got two birds. One's closer than the other. I think we ought to get in the middle of them. But I think once we got in there, you realized that. The, the night before the sound really carried and they were actually further apart than you thought. They were, yes. And so we both made the executive decision while it was still dark and we got in there really early and we sat there for probably 20 minutes with silence. Once they started gobbling, you know, the, the further bird gobbled first. I thought, well, maybe we ought to book it way down there after him. And then the bird, you know, ch- started chiming in. We were able to make an adjustment quick enough and it was still dark enough I think the key to that was we got close to that second bird or that closest bird. We got close to them, but not too close. Because once they start gobbling and they're awake, I'm a firm believer of that's not the time when you get close. You get as close as you possibly can without them seeing you or without them knowing that you're there. And we were able to get in close. I think another thing that helped us there was there was some kind of canopy of trees between us and where the bird was roosted and we were yes we made noise because there were several several of us walking you know on pine pine needles and you know what have you but there was enough you know cover between us and the bird that I, you know you were able to set up the blind i mean it was i mean it was perfect we actually moved right in on them and i think people if i if 
I think I could be much more aggressive getting close to birds than you think. Um, you think like the, the, the second setup where we were talking about where we marked them off the road. I mean, I literally think we could have walked 10 yards under their tree without spooking them. I agree. Not that we would want to, but I think if you go early enough in the dark, I literally think you could go lots of times and be 30 yards from them. If you go at, you know, 3 a.m., they, and you literally, not that you would, but you could literally shoot them out of the tree as soon as they make a gobble. You right. Get and that I, close. And I, I think you can do that over and over and over without screwing up your deal, but I'm always afraid to. I think if there's one thing I learned from you is get in there early. I had always got on birds early, but never as early as you do. I mean, we're up at 245 with birds roosted and usually set up under the bird by four at the latest, depending on how far our drive is. And I think as for a new turkey hunter or someone who's learning the ropes of turkey hunting and trying to learn how to be successful, I think that's with roosting and then getting in there early are probably the two things that can make you more successful. And it's really important to have the bird pinpointed from the night before if you're going to get in there early because if you're not a great turkey caller or you don't have a ton of experience, you know, killing turkeys, if you can get within 50 yards of that tree, even if you're not a great turkey caller and you got a couple of decoys out and you got in there quietly, just a couple of soft yelps on a very basic slate call and those birds are going to drop into your set and you're going to have a shot at a bird at 40 you know, 30, 40 yards. I, I would even argue that if you can get 50, 60, 70 yards from that bird roosted in the tree and you literally don't know how to call at all, I'm going to say, unless he flies completely away from you, you're going to get a shot probably in one direction or another because they just pitch down um, as long as they don't pitch, you know, over the top of you or, or a long distance away. If they pitch down, I mean, they're almost in range. Right. So I think set up. I think proper roosting and, and roost setup is more important than the quality of your calls because we're also talking about tree calls, you know, where it's just a couple little soft calls. And, and if they gobble to you, really, you could just sit there and wait and not make another peep. And you've got a really good chance of shooting a bird. Yeah. One thing that we should mention about on the early morning setup, once you're set up on a bird is you very rarely want to set up below a turkey downhill from a turkey. Cause remember they pitched into the tree typically from the top of the ridge and they're going to pitch out very similar direction for the most, most part. My experience has been is I've been on a couple of birds or flocks and kind of been dogging them to the tree and then watch them pitch into the tree. And if they're just doing their thing and then they pitch into the tree, my experience has been the next morning, they will generally pitch into the same spot to come out of the tree. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree anymore. I, I, I think, I think it's important to, to pay attention if you get the opportunity the night before, if you're fortunate to watch them fly up or, or, or be able to deduct from where they launch from. Right. From, if you know the launch point from where they pitch into the tree, even if that doesn't help you the next morning, if you say it's too loud and you say you can't get to that launch point, if you're going to hunt them the following night, most of the times they're going to come back and roost in those same areas. You can basically be set up with your decoys at the launch point, And now your afternoon setup success goes way up because you just learned that those turkeys pitch off that ridge within, say, a 50, 60, 70 yard area. And you know that the following night, the chances are they're going to pitch off that same lip into the tree you can basically be sitting there at three o'clock in the afternoon and have a nice afternoon sit and have your decoys and probably get a shot the very next night right on that spot. Well, the one thing I'd mention about that is that if you're hunting a general state unit, the birds are not as predictable as far as roosting in the same trees because it's a lot of it's based on pressure. If you're in a state unit that's known for good turkey hunting, um, I'd say like a 23 has a lot of birds those birds won't always roost in the same spot because they're getting pressured throughout the day. They're getting bumped around. And so just be aware of that. I mean, if you're hunting the reservation or a very limited turkey spot, you know, up on the strip hunting Rios or hunting ghouls somewhere, there's probably a pretty good chance they'll roost back into those trees. And so it is important to take note of that. And if you're a, again, a new turkey hunter, mark those roost spots 
on your phone or on your map because that's building data for your next year. Because if they don't use it the next night, the next night or the next night, eventually they're going to come back to that roof spot and, and use those trees. And so it's good to mark those spots. so You have an idea of where to, where to go back to and where to hunt. I mean, you're always trying to collect data and use it for later on down the road. Yeah. And a, another point to that note is, is like, um, if you're set up in the morning and you've got the bird that you roosted gobbling and now you hear over to the left and you can kind of see, and there's birds over there, remember where those other birds are gobbling and remember, okay, I got birds to the right. I got birds to the left because maybe you botch your bird coming out of the tree. Maybe you spook them. Maybe you shoot at them. Maybe you kill them. Maybe you have multiple tags. You're hunting in New Mexico or whatever, but you're like, oh, off that point over there on that east slope, I heard birds gobbling. So maybe that night, that's where you go set up in the chance that those birds come back to that roost. I think it's, I think one of the things that I've been blessed with is I'm very detail oriented and I take in all of what's going on. And I've learned to kind of be a predator, like, like take in all of that information so that when you go to kill, like, I'm going right there because I heard birds there. Well, that just gives you a percentage chance of, of a much better percentage of being able to be on birds because I heard them. It's not the bird I was after, but I paid attention to where they were, you know, mm-hmm. w- in that morning. So I, I, I think that's something to point out. Uh, I think we talked about where birds typically roost, contour lines. We talked about uh, how we roost using the buddy system. We talked about marking uh, where the birds are. And I, I think, um, let's move a little bit into setups. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about roost setups and then we'll talk about just kind of mid morning run and gun setups. I think setting up on a Turkey is more important than actually the sounds you make with your call or any of your calling. Of course, if you're horrible at calling, that can hurt you. But if you're just halfway decent on a turkey call, but you're very good at setups, I think you can kill a lot of turkeys. I think you can kill turkeys in your setup without even calling. Yeah, I think a setup is critical. I think you want to get as close as possible to that bird before you set up and start calling. And that can be difficult because it depends on how open the forest is. I mean, where we were hunting last week, we had spots that were super thick, and then we had spots where they would had done prescribed burns and a lot of the under undergrowth was gone and you're able to see 100 200 yards Uh, but i think one of the most important things is getting getting set up as close to the bird as possible and i'm talking about in the roost it applies it also applies though once the birds are on the ground and you're running and gunning you know mid-morning early afternoon type of deal Um, my general experience has been that if i get a bird to hit on a you know box call or to some sort of a yelp call from roughly 10 o'clock to four o'clock, my general experience has been that that bird is coming. So just be prepared. Even if he sounds a long ways off, he's probably coming if he's gobbling at that time. That's been my experience. Yeah. And I, I think to point to, to further that also, you know, I've busted so many birds because I keep thinking I got to close the distance. I got to get closer to that bird. And half the time I end up running smack dab into them. So it's something to be pointed out, which you say, say between 10 and four. So midday type setups, if you get a bird that gobbles good to your call and maybe gobbles a couple times, you're probably better off just planting it, getting set up in a good spot and waiting for that bird and being a little more patient. Um, I, I think, you're right. I mean, if, if, they, if they gobble to your call and maybe answer a couple times, if they answer more than once, you got a really good chance that he's going to come to you. So I would be a little more patient in that situation. And but, I'm talking, I mean, we're talking about go- gobbling to you, you know, like you said, a couple, a couple times, two or three times, they're probably coming in that 10 to four window. Uh, but I mean, you're making a turkey call. You're not using a crow locator or something like that. If you're using a crow locator, it's different you know, get yourself closer, then start trying to hammer that bird and get that bird going and things of such. Yesterday, that's what helped, you know, the bird that I killed yesterday, that bird gobbled and he was at least a half mile from me, maybe more. And he sounded a long ways off. So I started calling loud and just hitting him loud and he would gobble and respond 
pretty regularly, and it was very apparent very quickly that he was common. What once the bird yesterday, once it was apparent in his um, excitement level, you can tell from the intensity of their gobble. You you knew in your heart he was coming. Did you climb up, or did you give it to him just every once in a while? You know, I called a lot yesterday, and I'm kind of playing with a few different things, but I'm kind of getting to the point where I think that one of two things, when these birds are hand up and when a bird's coming from a long ways away, I think it's important to be making noise a lot because you want them coming to you. And the other thing that I did yesterday, even when the bird got closer, I changed my tone a little bit and got it a little softer, but I felt it was important to keep calling because I wanted the bird to come to a spot. And he did, and I had decoys out. So once he got within 50, 60 yards, you know, he spotted those decoys and he came right to my Jake decoy, but I didn't stop. I would stop for maybe 20 seconds and then start back up on, you know, a 30, 40, 50 second interval of yelps and trying to get him excited. Yeah. And I mean, playing the devil's advocate, some would argue that you want to, I mean, I've done it both ways too. And it's kind of fun. I like calling to them. So the more you call, the more they answer, the more they answer, it's just fun. And, but I've also played it the other way where they're real intense and I really let them gobble two or three times and I don't answer them. I play hard to get, then I hit them real excited and then they gobble and I shut immediately up or sometimes I'll answer them just, you know, a couple quick times and they'll fire again and then I'll just clam up. They're, they're really good about, they're amazing how they can hear it from a long ways away. And the next thing you know, they're standing, they're standing five minutes from, you know, five seconds or five, five yards from you right right and i what I, I felt like we called a lot more than we normally do when we hunted together this last week and where i where i found that it w- it worked for us this last week that i hadn't really and maybe it was just because the way the birds were acting is that we called in some hen up birds and we called the hens are what really what came to the decoy sets and two different occasions those the tops didn't even come to the decoys they just walked by the decoys, but the hens were at the decoys mm-hmm. attacking the decoys. Mm-hmm. And so it got me thinking as to, you know, maybe when I get a hen up bird, I need to be a little more aggressive when they're on the ground and see if I can get those hens to come. Because we all know that once you get the hens intrigued, just like calling elk or anything like that, if you can get the hens there and the toms are there, they're coming. Yeah, and, and I've found that the hens very rarely come when you're passive. The hens come when you're when you're more vocal, and if you can stay on them and you know stay with those hens doing the assembly yelping and stuff, I, you know I think that's huge. Uh, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, I know your time is precious. Let's talk a little bit about actual setups. Um, say running and gunning setups. In my opinion, you you know, if it's too open, it's not good. And if it's too thick, it's not good. If it's too open, those turkeys can see from a long ways away. They may be able to see the decoys, but they'll see that they're not moving. You know, I think sometimes that doesn't help. I think when it's too thick and you got brush all around you, they're a little leery to come where they think a coyote or a bobcat or some sort of predator is going to jump out of the brush. So I think there's kind of a happy medium of setting up in areas where they have to kind of come seek you out, but they do do have enough visual that they feel comfortable where something's not going to jump on them. And, and I think it it's definitely important to find that balance. You don't want to set up in a stand of jack pines. You don't want to set up in an oak thicket. I mean, they're not going to come in there to do that. And you want to give them some visual perception. I mean, you want them to see your decoys because you and I have both had birds come by our sets that were kind of interested but didn't see the decoys and never came. Right. And then you've had you know, the, the bird you called in for me last week that I gave a haircut to, you know, that bird, when he saw the decoy set from 150 yards out, he was running, he was full tilt running as fast as he could to the decoys. Yeah. And so, you know, I try to get those decoys in a big, in in a, out there so that, so, so that they can see them. And I try to stay back just a little bit into that thicker cover or something like that to give myself a little more freedom of movement. I think it's important to point out when you're setting up, set up in the shade, figure out which way your sun is moving, whether it's, you know, morning before noon or it's, you know, two, two, three o'clock where your sun is going and where you need to set up. So as that sun is shifting, you're going to be more in the shade 
rather than less in the shade. I think if your decoys can be in the sun, I typically like that because they can see them from a lot further away. But I think from you as a, as a hunter need to be set in the shade. If I can get my back to a big size type ponderosa pine that, that gives me a lot of cover, I think that's huge. And I like to, um, let's, uh, obviously this is an audio podcast, but let's say if you're using a clock and, and they're, uh, you're at six o'clock and say there is a bird at 12 o'clock. So straight out in front of you, if you're a right-handed shooter with a shotgun, I think it's important that you need to be set up at say two or three o'clock so that you can swing your shotgun uh, because if a bird comes to your right, uh, you'll have limited, you know, limited uh, uh, field of swing with your shotgun. I think that's important. Um, any, anything to add for setups? What I think is important is exactly what you mentioned. You want wherever the turkey is going to come into, if you're a right-handed shooter, you want your left shoulder basically pointed. If you're drawing a straight line out your left shoulder, that's what you want pointed at it. And it's the same for a bow as it is for, as for a gun. Because if you're a right-handed shooter, it's very easy to swing left. If you're a left-handed shooter, it's opposite. It's very easy to swing right. So you want to make sure that you set up that way. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to perfect the last couple of years we've been hunting together is trying to shoot birds with a bow. Obviously I love bow hunting. Turkeys are not exactly made for bow hunting and they've schooled me more than once. Um, but one of the things that I find is important is give yourself a couple of 12, as big of trees kind of between you and the bird. And what I, I don't mean bushes, I mean, Pine trees. So if you can get that are opaque that you can't see through, that you're almost behind where it blocks your whole field, right? Where they can't see you. Well, my yesterday I had the decoy set up. I had the the Jake set up at 16 yards, and I had three probably 12 inch to 18 inch diameter pine trees between me and the and the decoy, and they were not in a line. They were in different places, and I did that because I knew the bird would have to walk behind one of those trees and if I needed to I could draw now this bird came in solo so I just waited for him to get to the decoy and he was strutting and as soon as he pirouetted to where his tail was to me and you know his head sunk down blocked by his tail fan I came to full draw he had no idea and as soon as he pirouetted around to me I shot him you know and if you get a solo bird in I think we have put a lot of stress into trying to shoot birds out of a blind with a bow and I'm starting to think that the headache of trying to set that blind up and carry that blind everywhere is is almost not worth well, the pain. Well, the fact that they see the blind sometimes and they spook off too. I mean, you're running gun style like you did yesterday where there's no blind. I mean, we've had birds come and we're pretty convinced they looked at the blind and didn't like it. We've also had birds stand three feet from it and act like they didn't care. But, um, you know, I think that's one thing about a blind is sometimes those birds get funky and don't want to come near that blind i i definitely feel like this past trip that we had together that the birds were definitely weary to the blind the bird that i gave a haircut to there's no reason for that bird to come in and not just attack that jake but he definitely looked and saw that blind and freaked out mm -hmm. and you know like i said if you're calling a solo bird in there's no you don't need a blind in, in my belief, because the bird's going to come in strutting. And when he comes in strutting and he turns that tail to you, you're going to let him have it. Now, with that being said, you know, two things, you can take that Jake and make that Jake face you because that bird's going to come around to the front of that Jake and want to face that Jake head on. And so when you set that Jake decoy out there, you might want to set that Jake decoy facing you because you know, he's going to come around to the front of that bird. But typically my experience, your experience, they always, when they come in, they're, they're going to spin around that bird multiple times right. and they're going to give you plenty of t chances to draw your bow. And, and my buddy, Chris Rowe would argue to put the, um, decoy parallel. So facing parallel so that the bird comes and you have a broadside shot. Right. So I understand all of that. I, I kind of like the decoys facing me because that tells the bird that's coming in that this bird is looking in my direction and there's no fear here. There's no problem. And we can talk about decoy setups another time, but I think it's a great point that, you know, it, it's, 
it's kind of a crapshoot as far as setups, but it's, it's something you kind of learn and you get get familiar with. It'll be interesting next season uh, when we get to hunt together. Maybe we ought to just try and go without the blind. I mean, I was with Mike Jones, same type of thing. We had two big trees. He was behind one of them, but there's another. So we had several potential possibilities where he could literally draw and the bird could, he could stand up and jump around and the bird wouldn't see him. Right. And then there's another tree that's out, you know, 15 yards that if that bird goes behind it, now he's got two trees that are basically blocking him. And maybe that's the ticket. Well, I mean, yesterday's setup for me was perfect, but to, to go back to what your buddy, uh, Chris Rose says, talks about, I like to shoot the bird if he's facing me with my bow, because it's a very easy spot to aim at right below where the net goes into the body and right above the beard. If you hit that bird there with an arrow in that vertical line, he's done. Right. My arrow right went below in there, color and my arrow went in there yesterday and came out just next to his, uh, where his tail fan comes together. So just next to his butt. And that bird went 20 yards and fell over dead and was stone cold dead. Yeah. And when I, Rested the bird this morning. Um, I didn't damage a single ounce of meat. The bird, the arrow went right through the center of that bird, and both of those turkey breasts are completely intact. They're actually on the smoker right now, and we're gonna go eat them for Easter dinner. So I mean, that's it, awesome. but I like that mark because I think it's hard to find a mark on a bird that's strutting broadside. It looks like a bigger target, but you still have a very, very small target to shoot at. I, I couldn't agree more. We talked about this, um, my Texas experience. And it, it, yeah, I mean, we can talk about it more. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and uh, congratulate you on your success of uh, running up and getting a bird yesterday. And, and uh, Jaron's, Jaron got a double uh, and it's, it was fun hunting with Nicole, Jaron, and you, and I look forward to doing it again. I want to thank you for your time here, and um, it's always fun trying to figure these dang birds out. Turkey hunting's a lot of people, either people love turkey hunting or they think you're crazy, but I'll tell you what, how can you not love to chase a bird that's gobbling to you, coming in, it's super beautiful, provides great food, and the best thing about turkeys is they're inexpensive to hunt no matter where you're yeah, going. You can hunt them all over. I mean, you can go hunt them on state land. You can hunt them on the reservations. You can go to other states. You can hunt turkeys in any state. I would say even as a non-resident for even on a guided deal where you're hunting private land for anywhere from 500 to a thousand bucks, typically for two birds. Yeah. So, I mean, they're a great experience. It's exceptional for kids because they're super vocal and they're really cool to watch. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a really, really neat experience and there's a lot of hunter opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I, you know, every year I, I hunt and I don't know how many birds I've seen shot. I don't know how many birds I've shot, but it, it never gets old. I, I told, um, uh, Mike, you know, I'm like this, it's the same. Every time I get the same rush, whether I'm shooting or if a bird comes in strutting goblin, it's the same feeling. And I hope that never goes away. And it, it, I get the same feeling on every Turkey. Yep. Me too. I mean, it's probably in the hundreds of birds that I've seen get shot and it's the same feeling every time they're just fun and the best part about turkeys when you're done you walk over with one hand and pick it up and carry it back to the truck there's no no major 18 trips up. there's no yeah. you know 500 hundred dollar backpack to carry the thing out with i mean it's it's just so much fun yeah for sure well buddy thanks and um it's been fun look forward to next year and i'm headed uh on my gould's turkey hunts down in mexico i'll be gone almost a month and um, looking forward to some really good hunting down there and I know people listening probably are already hunting in New Mexico a bunch of states are already open and here in Arizona with the youth season starting real quick and then the general season wish everybody the best of success I uh, want to encourage you guys to um, if you have any questions uh, send them to jscottoutdoors at gmail.com and um, I just appreciate all the listener support. And thank you, Brian, for coming and uh, sh sharing some knowledge here. I can't wait to see your videos from Mexico. I'm sure you'll have some great ones. It's going to be fun. Thanks for having me. Take care, buddy. Bye.